In this lecture for block 8, we're going to discuss Sanford derma, which is yellow discoloration of the skin, and we're going to talk about it more from a physiological perspective. Where does all this yellow pigment come from? Okay, so abnormal yellow pigment, or the abnormally yellow patient, can be due to one of the, the patient can be abnormally yellow due to one of the following pigments. Uh, bilirubin, which is the main pigment involved in jaundice, biliverdin, beta carotene, uh, which is uh, present in a disease called keratinosis, which is usually due to overeating carrots and other various orange colored um, fruits and veggies. Lycopene, uh, which is a yellow pigment found in tomatoes and various other veggies and fruits, um, and also that's due to usually due to overeating of said fruits and veggies. Um, riboflavin, vitamin B2, uh, this is called riboflavinemia, that can also cause abnormal yellow pigmentation. Saffron is a type of spice, uh, if you eat enough of it you're going to go yellow. Fluorescein is a medication that we use, um, we usually drop it on the eye, and it makes the eye yellow. Um, but the nice thing about fluorescein is that when you shine a blue light, if there's any ulcer or injury on the eye, it's going to shine um, bright blue in a dark room. So you will use that quite a lot if you're examining eyes. And people don't generally ingest it, so they usually don't go yellow. But um, uh, the patient's eye will remain stained yellow for about a day after you drop in a fluorescein staining. And various medications um, and chemicals can cause abnormal yellow pigmentation. And of all these uh, different pigments, we're going to go mostly into uh, the physiology of bilirubin. Um, bilirubin is a metabolic waste product from the breakdown of red blood cells, specifically the heme uh, part of the red blood cell. So that hemoglobin uh, that's in the red blood cell is broken up into its protein, the globin, the globin and the heme, and the heme is degraded. And this can happen either um, in the bloodstream where the red blood cells die and then split apart uh, wherever they are or what might happen in the liver and the copper cells or it can happen in the spleen and the splenic macrophages. But regardless whether the red blood cell is taken up by the macrophage and broken down or whether, just, uh, or the, whether the blood cell just breaks down spontaneously and is absorbed um, and just the breakdown products are absorbed, point is eventually um, all those red blood cell components end up in a macrophage uh, which breaks down the hemoglobin into heme, and then heme in and of itself is broken into protoporphyrin and, and, and iron. The protopyphorin uh, is then broken down into carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is eventually exhaled, um, and then what's left over is referred to as biliverdin. An enzyme that um, does this reaction is called heme oxygenase. Then we have biliverdin reductase, which breaks down biliverdin into bilirubin. And most of this breakdown occurs in the spleen, simply because the spleen has the highest population of macrophages in the human body, and macrophages are uh, the cells that um, have these enzymes and actually um, uh, cause these reactions. So this bilirubin, referred to as free bilirubin or unconjugated bilirubin, is toxic. It inhibits enzymes, it breaks down cell membranes, um, it prevents you from making ATP through oxidative phosphorylation, it uh, prevents protein synthesis through phos uh, some proteins need phosphates, so it prevents protein phosphorylation. And, and especially in babies and newborns, um, because their blood brain barriers are not very developed, uh, that free bilirubin can easily cross into the brain and cause brain damage. Uh, which is why jaundice can be a particularly disabling and dangerous illness in the newborn. Okay, so that bilirubin waste product, that unconjugated bilirubin, is insoluble. It cannot dissolve in water, it cannot dissolve in blood. So most of it has to bind with albumin. So the albumin takes some of, its, uh, some of this bilirubin into the skin and dumps it in the skin, and either sunlight or blue spectrum light 
can alter it into cis bilirubin, which is just uh, an isomer of bilirubin. And this isomer happens to be water soluble, it's much less toxic. It easily dissolves in blood and easily crosses uh, through the hepatocytes in the liver and goes into your bile. However, the rest of this unconjugated bilirubin is transported by albumin uh, to the liver, to the hepatocytes, and there they are conjugated uh, to glucuronic acid to form bilirubin glucuronide, which is a fertus conjugated bilirubin. And a tiny amount of this b conjugated bilirubin is excreted via the kidneys, but uh, the most of it will be excreted via bile, at least in patients with a working bile duct system. And the bilirubin in bile will be about 98% conjugated and 2% unconjugated from the, um, the con um, from the bilirubin that was altered in the skin. And there are some minor um, other alternative pathways to break down bilirubin. Um, which are probably more important in the disease patient rather than a healthy patient. Uh, and as an example, cytochrome P450, um, if that is induced by a medication you're taking, in other words, if a medication take um, somehow stimulates the increase of cytochrome P450, um, your bilirubin levels will drop. Um, anyway, these pathways are thought to exist. Um, if they do exist, they are fairly minor. Um, and they're not considered to be too clinically significant. So if you're not really aware of these pathways, you're probably not missing much. Okay, so um, this bilirubin uh, is excreted via the bile into the gut, and if there is beta-glucuronidase in the gut, uh, that conjugated bilirubin is uh, deconjugated and is quickly reabsorbed um, through the gut wall, and this is especially present, this enzyme is especially present in breast milk, so that causes the famous uh, breast milk jaundice. But uh, otherwise, conjugated bilirubin is quickly broken down by bacteria, and they convert it into urobilinogen. Some of the urobilinogen will be reabsorbed through the gut wall and is either re excreted through bile or else excreted by the kidneys. Most of the urobilinogen, however, is converted again by the bacteria into stercobilinogen, uh, which is brown in color and gives feces of the brown color. And through this way, most bilirubin is ultimately converted to stercobilinogen and then excreted by the gut. Okay, so when thinking of bilirubin as a cause of jaundice, um, you have to think of the whole sort of bilirubin pathway. Either the, there's too much bilirubin being made from um, hen breakdown, um, or there's an inability of um, that bilirubin to be converted into conjugated bilirubin, uh, and as there's an inability to convert toxic bilirubin into a non-toxic bilirubin, or there's an obstruction preventing bilirubin from uh, being excreted because most of it has to be kind of go out through the gut, isn't it? So uh, the causes of jaundice are usually divided into three groups: the hemolytic. Um, jaundice where you've got excess breakdown of red blood cells, there's far too much heme and that heme is made into uh, lots of bilirubin. So diseases that uh, can cause excess breakdown will be diseases like hypersplenism where you have a hyperfunctioning spleen breaking down too many red blood cells or for example malaria uh, where the malaria parasite invades red blood cells and splits them apart. So any condition where red blood cells are popping can cause uh, hemolytic jaundice. And with hepatic jaundice, which is when the hepatocytes cannot, uh, they can't absorb bilirubin and they cannot conjugate bilirubin. Uh, so any disease that uh, knocks out the function of the hepatocytes, such as a viral hepatitis uh, or alcoholic liver disease, um, can cause jaundice through this mechanism. And then the last part, uh, if the liver is functioning fine, but um, the bile ducts are obstructed or the gallbladder is obstructed or there's something preventing that bile from getting into the gut, um, there's eventually going to be backflow of bile into the bloodstream. Um, instead, uh, instead of so instead of uh, bile going into the gut, there's going to be backflow uh, into the bloodstream and then you're going to have conjugated bilirubin in the bloodstream causing jaundice. So here um, there's an uh, inability to conjugate bilirubin, so you can have unconjugated bilirubin of the hepatic jaundice. Um, also unconjugated bilirubin of hemolytic uh, jaundice, what of obstructive jaundice, you can have conjugated bilirubin causing your jaundice. 
Okay, I've mentioned that Billy Verdon is converted into Billy Rubin. And Billy Verdon has a bit of a bluish green and, and light levels can also give a bit of a yellow tinge, um, depending on its concentration. And it adds to the color um, of jaundice when you have too much bilirubin. Strictly speaking, you sh uh, there is a possibility that you can have an isolated bilirubin excess, uh, but that's not really been described in humans. It happens in birds um, that they can have a, a lack of an uh, enzyme to convert bilirubin into bilirubin, and then uh, the bilirubin deposits in their eggs and they give off these incredibly blue eggs. Uh, which freaks farmers out. The chickens have this um, deficiency because then the chickens are laying blue eggs and everyone is freaked out when the eggs are blue and thinks there's something wrong with it. In reality, the egg is just fine, it's just the shell is very blue. Um, but nevertheless, the farmers don't, uh, the farmers freak out of it. But um, that's veterinary science. For human medicine, isolated believed in excess is probably not, um, it's not yet uh, described as a clinical entity. Um, and as I said, uh, with jaundice, um, as uh, you do have some increased bilirubin levels because there's so much bilirubin that that enzyme process that converts bilirubin to bilirubin backs up, and then you have increasing bilirubin levels as well, and that contributes to discoloration. And um, just as a sort of practical application, when you have bruises, um, the red blood cells in the bruise break down and um, and form bilirubin. Bilirubin gives more of a green color to your bruise, and as the bilirubin is broken down further into bilirubin, your bruise will become yellow. Okay, keratinosis is a disease of excess serum uh, beta carotene. Beta carotene is a very yellow molecule, and um, it deposits easily in fat, and it can cause a body-wide yellow discoloration of the skin that can easily be mistaken for jaundice. The one distinguishing feature of keratinosis versus jaundice is that in keratinosis, the sclera of your eyes are usually um, unaffected. Beta carotene uh, tends to dissolve in fats, so wherever this fat is going to dissolve, such as under your skin, the eye doesn't have a lot of fat, so beta carotene does not tend to deposit in fat, whereas um, if you take conjugated bilirubin, um, that is water, a water-soluble molecule. It will easily dissolve wherever there's water, so there's lots of fluid in the eye, so it will dissolve very easily into the eye, um, in contrast. Okay, beta-carotene is absorbed um, and transported by micelles, and that is the same way that fat is absorbed and uh, is converted into vitamin A through enzymes um, in lipid and liver tissue. Um, Excess beta carotene is mostly excreted via the gut and through sebaceous glands in your skin. But now, um, if these mechanisms fail, if these excretion mechanisms fail uh, or they're overwhelmed, you can have an increase in beta carotene and you're going to become yellow. And there's three sort of uh, main ways that uh, this can occur. Either you're going to eat too much of that beta carotene, so you're going to eat too many carrots, too many papayas, too many oranges, um, too much red palm oil, etc., etc. There's a whole list of um, fruits and veggies that, um, y is pos uh, that can make you yellow if taken in excess. But remember, beta carotene is lipophilic or it uh, dissolves in fat, so any condition where you have a lot of fat in your bloodstream is also going to predispose you to keratinosis because the blood, um, the beta carotene is going to so easily dissolve into your blood and it's going to be much easier to absorb uh, the beta carotene than usual. And conditions where this happens is um, hypothyroidism. So with hypothyroidism, your glucose um, burning mechanisms are uh, down-regulated, so your body has to rely more on fat. Uh, as an energy source, so there's fat breakdown, which can cause uh, keratinosis um, due to excessive absorption of beta carotene. Diabetes mellitus, you're unable to s uh, take in glucose into your tissue, so your human body again shifts to fat breakdown as an energy source, so your blood becomes filled with fat and becomes more, can more easily absorb beta carotene. In anorexia nervosa, you stop eating enough calories, so you start living off your fat, your fat um, your fat stores in the body break down and flood the bloodstream with fat. Um, in nephrotic syndrome, 
you're losing a lot of protein for your kidneys, so uh, you develop a relative caloric deficit and then um, the fat has to break down in order to compensate for all the protein you're losing and um, very rapid weight loss or uh, a very drastic sort of diet plan can also cause um, yellow discoloration for the same reason that anorexia nervosa uh, can cause um, keratinosis. So for all these diseases your patients, if they're not well controlled, can develop a yellowish tinge of the skin, uh, not due to jaundice, but due to um, ex um, excessive absorption of beta carotene uh, by this fatty blood. And lastly, um, beta carotene needs to be converted to vitamin A, and if there's a failure of conversion of this, um, if there's a failure of this enzyme reaction, you're going to have too little vitamin A and too much beta carotene. So in hypothyroidism, there's the unregulation of that enzyme, so that contributes to the yellowish discoloration. In anorexia nervosa, there's also downregulation of your enzymes in an attempt to reduce your metabolic rate. Um, if you have liver disease, um, so that enzyme is not produced because you have a diseased liver, um, that can tr contribute to keratinosis, and um, you're already at risk of developing jaundice if you have uh, liver disease. So this is an additional sort of... Um, discoloration factor, if you will. And there are some genetic diseases where you just don't have um, um, enough enzymes to uh, break down beta carotene fast enough to vitamin A and a single carrot is going to make you very yellow. <coughs> okay, lycopene is a carotenoid molecule, so it's a lot like carotene, uh, beta carotene. Um, but the unique feature of this, carot uh, this uh, lycopene is that it cannot be converted into um, vitamin A. But otherwise, it's exactly the same as beta carotene. It's also lipid soluble. It's gotten rid of the same way. It's otherwise processed in the same way and stored in the same way, except for the fact that it cannot be converted to vitamin A. And it's quite rich in tomatoes, in rose hips, which is um, the edible stem uh, of the rose flower, um, and some berries. And lycopenemia, or uh, the disease of excess lycopene, can sometimes only cause discoloration of the hands, feet, and palate. Um, and sclera are also usually unaffected um, because of its lack of water solubility. So if you have a patient just with discoloration of hands, feet, and the mouth, and there's no other yellow discoloration, it's probably something to do with lycopene. Other causes of uh, abnormal yellow discoloration, if you take in too much vitamin B2, uh, that can also cause yellow discoloration, sometimes red discoloration. Uh, usually does not involve the sclera because vitamin B2 is water soluble. Uh, there are also some rare illnesses that can cause this discoloration. Um, multiple myeloma or monoclonal clonal gammopathy. Uh, that's when you have antibodies produced uh, in these diseases that actually bind with vitamin B2 as if it were a pathogen and they make this uh, huge complex with uh, vitamin B2 and this complex is um, somewhat soluble in fat and then this complex can actually deposit in the skin causing yellow discoloration. And as I said there are many other chemicals and spices and medications that can cause some yellow discoloration and the tricky thing about these guys is sometimes they also involve the sclera. These are all my references and I highly recommend this particular article uh, on Xanthoderma because in this article they also give you a flow diagram that you can use um, on any patient that presents with yellowness and you just follow the, uh, the flow diagram and you'll eventually um, get to a diagnosis.